Hello. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rowe-Seiler, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dana Green will be speaking about bats in Saskatchewan, conservation, collaboration, and current research. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Before we begin, I'd like to note that PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation about anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. We'll be taking a break during the December holidays and our next Native Prairie Speaker Series will be in January on the 27th about pie build and horned grapes in Saskatchewan. We also have presentations lined up for February and March about invasive species. You can register for these webinars on the PCAP website, and all past webinar presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel, and this webinar will be uploaded there in the near future. And to all of our listeners out there, we have well over 100 people on the line today, uh, so if you have any questions during the presentation, just type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard, and questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you're on a cell phone, you can send it by chat to the organizer. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, Sask Energy, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsors are Camp Wolfillow, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. Special today, Jane Sky from Sask Energy, our presenting sponsor, will be bringing greetings and introducing our speaker. So I'd like to pass it over to Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jane Skye, and I am an environmental sustainability anal analyst with Sask Energy. I am so pleased to be here today to bring greetings on behalf of Sask Energy and introduce today's presenter, Dana Green. It is an honor to join so many environmental professional students and conversationists who are to, we're here taking part in this webinar. The topic today the conservation, collaboration, and current research on native bats of Saskatchewan is important to all of us. As the syllabus states, whether acting as a natural form of pest control, pollinating flowering plants, or spreading seeds across the landscape, bats are essential members of the ecosystem where they reside. The webinar serves as a great opportunity to share and learn the latest research on Saskatchewan's coolest species, and I am personally very excited to be participating. Whether it's protecting our natural landscape, or the at-risk species they inhabit. Sask Energy is committed to continuous learning with respect to environmental stewardship in Saskatchewan and incorporating new best practices in our daily operations. As part of this commitment, Sask Energy strives to support initiatives designed to promote both public awareness and professional development regarding the protection and conservation of the environment. Supporting the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan is particularly important to Saskatchewan and Sask Energy, because of the nature of our operations, we take the protection and restoration of natural prairie very seriously when installing new gas lines. Because we know that the first step in protecting all species begins with protecting their habitat. Beyond basic land restoration, Sask Energy has also taken on a number of habitat enhancement projects. For example, our two-year partnership with Nature Conservancy Canada, supporting their efforts to conserve the biodiversity in the Great Sand Hills in Southwest Saskatchewan. On behalf of Sask Energy, we wish to thank PCAP and other speaker series webinar presenters for their hard work and commitment to our environment. To the participants, we hope that you enjoy this interesting and informative webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dana Green. Dana is a PhD candidate at the University of Regina studying migratory bat ecology. Originally from Missouri in the US, Dana has worked with bats and other mammals across North America. Her passion in life revolve around being in the outdoors, whether conducting her research in Cypress Hills or flying her falconry bird. Dana aims to continue doing active bat research in Canada for both migratory species and species affected by white nose syndrome. She hopes to add baseline ecological knowledge for Canada's migratory bat species to her PhD work, aiding in their conservation in the dynamic modern world. Dana is active in outreach and education, collaborative research, and in professional scientific communities. She is currently a student representative for the North American Society of Bat Research and a board member of the American Society of Mammologists. 
On behalf of Sask Energy, please help me welcome Dana Green. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you all so much for coming today and thank you for the introduction. Uh, so ooh, there we go. <laughs> I'm very excited to be giving this talk today and I hope that you uh, learned something new today about what all is happening in Saskatchewan uh, for both the conservation of our bat species, but also uh, how the, the province is really coming together in a very collaborative way. Uh, and if you want to follow more about me, my research and my antics, uh, feel free to follow my uh, TikTok or Instagram page with the handle the eye patch biologist. So uh, with that, I'm first going to go uh, very start off very basic and go into why bats are not scary. So let's do a little bit of myth busting here. Uh, first myth, bats attack people. That is a very big myth. The truth is, is that bats are probably going to be a lot more afraid of you than you are of them. Uh, you are a large, scary monster to them, and so they're going to avoid you as best as they can. They're just flying around trying to live their best bat life. This is kind of a semi-myth. Bats suck blood. Uh, there are over 1,400 different species of bats, and only three of those are vampire bats. And we really do not need to be worrying about these in Canada because the vampire bats are going to be occurring in Mexico, Central and South America. So they are not going to be coming up here. Uh, and more so, you don't have to be scared of vampire bats because one, look at that face. You do not need to be afraid of that face. And they're not usually going to be going after people. They're usually looking for something like a cow, a pig, or a horse. So we really do not need to be concerned about blood sucking bats. Bats are pests. Actually, this is a very big myth because bats are going to be the biggest form of pest control. There are many insect eating bats and a single insect eating bat can eat thousands of insects in a single night. Myth, all bats have rabies. Again, very big myth because it is less than 1% of bats that have an active rabies infection. And if you do find a bat out in the daytime, on the ground or in your house, leave it be and call a professional and someone can come and take care of it for you. Uh, I can uh, personally attest to giving, I gave my number to my town office and I have been called numerous times to rescue bats out of people's homes. So just call professionals and don't worry about um, the potential of them likely having rabies. It's very unlikely. So some fun facts about bats. Why are bats so amazing? First off, they can fly. How amazing is uh, fly. Everyone probably has daydreamed or had dream, literal dreams about flying, and bats are the only mammal that actually evolved true flight. There are things like flying squirrels and sugar gliders and flying lemurs, but none of them are actually capable of true flight. They're gliders. Bats are the only mammal that have full-fledged powered flight. Again, hitting on the fact that there are over 1,400 different species of bats. That is a huge amount of diversity, second only to the diversity of rodents, and it comprises almost a quarter of all mammalian species. So incredibly diverse, found across most of the continents. Bats can be extremely social. Bats can occur in massive colonies full of millions of individuals, and they can be incredibly social. In fact, the best example of a social species are some of those vampire bat species. Vampire bats are actually considered to be altruistic and they will do things such as share their meals, take care of one another, and even in some cases for species with pup rearing. Again, hitting on that insect eating again, uh, insect eating again, their uh, single bat can eat between two to 6,000 insects in a single night. So again, thank your bats for that and bats can live an incredibly long time. Many species live between 10 and 20 years, but there are some species that can live over 30 years. And we're actually gonna hit on that a little bit later in the talk today. Bats and their ecosystems. How are they benefiting the natural world? How are they benefiting their ecosystem? Again, bat pest control. Insects play a massive role in the environment, but if they become overabundant, they can cause a lot of damage to our natural, natural systems. So again, that those insect eating bats are going to be eating 70 to 100% in their body weight in a single night. So very important for their ecosystem. Pollinators. 
Uh, there are plants that only flower at night and are targeted by bats for pollination. There are many different types of sentry plants and cacti in the deserts that are solely pollinated by different species of bats. Similar, seed dispersers. There are many species of fruit eating bats and they are going to be consuming the seeds along with that. And when they fly off to go find another guava, well, while they're flying, they are going to be pooping. And that poop is going to get spread all across the landscape, spreading those seeds at the same time, which can increase our forest cover. So very important for both pollination and seed dispersal. But what about the economy? How are bats also benefiting people? Again, that pest control. If you think about the number of insect pests that are going to be impacting different agricultural crops, bats are really, really helping out agriculture. One of the best examples I have ever heard is from the state of Texas. They did an analysis trying to actually put a dollar value onto what the Mexican free-tailed bat it was saving the te uh, Texans every year in agricultural pest control. And what they found is that because of the amount of uh, insect pests that these bats, that this one species, one species of bats was consuming, it was saving Texas almost $4 billion a year. So if you extrapolate that out to all of the states and then all of the provinces and then all of North America, just imagine what all of these insect eating bats are saving the agricultural industry in a year. It's amazing. Food products, if you think about the pollination and seed dispersing bats, they are benefiting the economy as well. They are pollinating and spreading the seeds of a lot of products that we like to consume. Bananas, avocados, dates, vanilla. It's where we get tequila because they are pollinating the agave plants. And also things like chocolate. So if you like chocolate, if you like tequila, you should really, really, really be thanking your bats. Now the bats that we have in Saskatchewan, like I said, there are over 1400 different species all across the world. Saskatchewan has fewer than 20, but the ones that we do have here are really amazing species. Uh, so the ones that I have here are the more regionally or sedentary species, so they're not going to be highly migratory. These are the ones that are sticking around the province. We have big brown bats, little brown bats, and a variety of other smaller myotis bats, including the long-eared. And the little brown bat is endangered in Canada, and we're going to be spending some time talking about the little brown myotis later on in the talk as we go through. Now we also, oh, I'm sorry, these bats are also the ones that are most likely to be hibernating. So these are the ones that you can, uh, the big brown bat, for example, you can find in your house. So if you find a bat in your house, odds are it's going to be a big brown bat, which is the one we have here on the top left. And then other species are going to be hibernating in things like crevices and caves and other types of structures. But then we also have migratory species. And this is where uh, my expertise comes in. I have focused my efforts on studying migratory bats and migratory ecology of these bats. Uh, we have the Eastern red bat, which is not quite as abundant as the other two, which are the hoary and silver haired bat. So the hoary bat is the largest bat that we have not only in Saskatchewan, but in all of Canada. They are quite large and uh, probably about, if you put your two hands together, and stretch out your, your thumb and your pinky fingers. They're about that long, so about a foot across. And the silver-haired bat is probably about half, a, half the size or smaller, but also still highly migratory. And these migratory species are traveling vast distances to come to Saskatchewan in the summertime to have their pups. So Saskatchewan's a very important place for these bat species, especially for the summer months. So let's hit on some threats that bats are currently facing within the province uh, and within uh, all of North America. So first we have city expansion. City expansion is going to be pushing out a lot of these sensitive species because there are some that are not as tolerant to human activity as others. The big brown bat will readily uh, be in buildings, in churches, or in homes, uh, but other species are a lot more sensitive to uh, human structures. So things like housing developments can be damaging for tree roosting species. And I throw in that example, and I have a couple of pictures down there at the bottom right, of one such species. That is the Indiana bat that I studied for a while in the state of Missouri. And that particular species is considered critically endangered. And they are being pushed out of a lot of areas, and they are having a lot of reduced 
habitat because they have very specific summertime roosting requirements. And while I was working in Missouri, I actually was a part of a survey that found one of the largest documented roost trees for the species found within the state ever. And that roost tree just so happened to be on a new housing development. And so the, the entire colony ended up getting pushed out of the area uh, because of this incoming housing development. So things like that can really impact those sensitive species. And then of course you have things like introduced species such as disease spread, like white nose syndrome, which we will get on later in the talk, and then predation. So things like feral cats or people who let their cats outdoors can impact the population of our different bat species. And then that can also bring a potential disease into our home because if your cat eats a bat, well, maybe something uh, more unfortunate can happen into the future. <coughs> Now there's also the uh, issue of the wind energy, the increasing wind energy and increasing wind industry and bats. This is a very big issue for our migratory tree roosting bats because they are suffering roughly uh, about 400,000 fatalities annually every year um, at wind energy facilities. And 70, again, 78% of those are our migratory tree roosting species. So the Eastern Red, the Silver Haired, and the hoary bats. But wind energy is continuing to expand and I am never going to pretend like I am against that. I am so excited that there's this big push towards green energy, renewable energy, including, including the wind industry. Uh, so from 2000 to 2020, Canada has seen a drastic increase in wind energy going from only 114 megawatt production to over 13,000. And in the states, that's even more extreme, going from over from about 2,500 megawatt production to over 100,000. Now, in Canada, it's Alberta and Saskatchewan that are really having some increased uh, megawatt production and wind energy expansion, which is very exciting for the provinces. And it's only going to be a good thing moving forward. But I always try to stress that the expansion of things like the wind industry does not need to be at the expense of our wildlife. And so it's very important for researchers across the province and across the country to work hand in hand with people in industry uh, to promote both the conservation of our wildlife like our migratory bat species, while also promoting the expansion of wind energy products. And Sask Energy is actually a really great example of this. Um, I know firsthand that Sask Energy has promoted um, a lot of research going into um, bats, bat activity, and bat monitoring. So Saskatchewan is definitely doing its part in that context. Focusing in a little bit on the hoary bat, because that is the species that has been most affected by wind energy expansion, uh, it has been predicted uh, over the last couple of years, a series of papers have come out predicting the probability of population decline and potential extinction for the species. And with continued build out, and that's the figure that I have there of uh, installed megawatt production build out predictions uh, there on the right. If that build out were to continue, there is a very high risk of at least a 50% population decline and potential extinction of the hoary bat as early as 2050. So this is a very, very pressing conservation issue. And so I have this quote here uh, from uh, that the current fatality rate of hoary bats at wind energy facilities in the United States and Canada poses a risk to the population and turbine related mortality may plausibly be high enough to have already caused substantial decline. And that came out of a very substantial research paper uh, just this year. Uh, luckily, there is a lot of research going into how we can mitigate and reduce the amount of fatalities these bats suffer at wind energy facility. And a couple of these researchers that I am so thrilled to be working with personally, uh, such as Dr. Aaron Bearwald and Dr. Mark Brigham and other researchers all across Canada, helping to promote the conservation and uh, to promote mitigating, uh, mitigating the loss and reducing the loss of our migratory bat species. And coming up here through the pipeline, um, I have had the privilege of working on the team to write the report for CASIWIC, or the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, 
uh, to list our migratory species as threatened or endangered. So this is uh, the report has been written and submitted and has already been reviewed by uh, the Kasiwa Committee a couple of times already. And ho hopefully coming up here pretty soon, these species will be listed as endangered. And once they're listed as endangered, we can start taking more measures for the conservation of these migratory species. So more to come on that. And you'll probably be hearing more and more about our migratory species in Saskatchewan moving forward. But something that uh, potentially a lot of us have heard of is white nose syndrome. And this is uh, definitely a pressing conservation issue. White nose syndrome is a fungal disease. It is caused by the fungus Pseudogymnoascus destructans, or PD. And it can infect the muzzles, ears, and wings of hibernating bats. A little bit of the history of white nose syndrome. It was first found in North America in 2006, and they can actually pinpoint almost the exact location of where this fungus inoculated a cave in the United States. And since it, since it was introduced into North America, it has spread rapidly across the continent. It has radiated out of the focal point and has just been spreading farther and farther and farther as the years have gone on. And unfortunately, it has the, the fungus, pseudogymno, uh, or PD, pseudogymnoascus destructans, has now been detected in Saskatchewan. And so this only came out this year. So this is very new evidence of the, of the spread of white nose, or at least of PD within Canada. Uh, and so it is increasing the importance of monitoring uh, populations of bats susceptible, such as our little brown myotis. To date, White nose syndrome has caused over 6 million mortalities, a lot more than that probably at this point. And seven of those bat species are, are, seven species of bat are currently affected and three of those are already considered endangered, including the endangered little brown myotis in Canada. So what specifically does it do? It invades and adjusts the skin of hibernating bats and it can cause them to wake up more frequently in the winter or rouse out of hibernation, which uses up fat stores. It takes a lot of energy to rouse out of hibernation. And when they wake up, when they rouse in the middle of winter, they have to replenish those energy stores. However, it's the middle of winter. There are no insects, the water is frozen, and so they have no way to replenish the energy uh, replenish the fat stores and get the energy that they need to then continue on with hibernation. And unfortunately, many of the bats affected by white nose syndrome can die from starvation. It can cause the destruction of wing tissue and the ability for bats water and electrolyte balance. So they are, it can affect a lot of their physiological processes. And some bats may survive winter, However, when they, when they rouse out of hibernation in the spring, they may not have enough energy to fully get themselves back to full health and will still subsequently um, suffer mortality because of the fungus. So with all of those pressing conservation issues for the bats that we have here in Saskatchewan, there is a lot being done within the province that is quite exciting and there's a lot of research and collaboration happening across the province and I'm excited to share a little bit of it with you today. Uh, so I will be talking about all three of these species, both the silver and hoary bats, our silver-haired and hoary bats, our migratory species, and the little brown myotis. Most of the research that I will uh, talk about today is going to be happening within the Cypress Hills. That is where I do all of my research, um, at least the field-based research that I do. I do have a couple of collaborations with uh, the Alberta government as well. Uh, beginning in the spring, Hoary and silver-haired bats migrate to the Cypress Hills and they have the ability to migrate over a thousand kilometers just to be in the Cypress Hills in the summertime. And the little brown myotis migrates regionally. So they're actually hibernating somewhere within a 500 kilometer radius of the Cypress Hills and they will regionally migrate to the Cypress Hills to also have their pups in the summertime. Now I work out in West Block. So there's West Block and Center Block for the Cypress Hills portion of uh, the provincial park. And West Block straddles the Saskatchewan and Alberta border. And I like to kind of refer to the Cypress Hills as a sky island. It rises 430 meters above the surrounding prairie landscapes. And while it does have a lot of native prairie plant life, there's also a lot of, a lot of mountain species. 
Uh, so you get a lot of different types of diversity for your forest cover, for your shrub cover. And so it really is just kind of like a little island refugia uh, that was cut away as the glaciers receded northwards. Uh, so it's a very, very unique, amazing ecosystem. Uh, and it's just so, it's absolutely delightful to work there in the summertime. <coughs> uh, so going into the migratory bats that occur in the Cypress Hills, again, both hoary and silver-haired bats have very extensive ranges across North America. We have silver-haired bats on the left and hoary bats on the right, and the white square that you see there indicates roughly where the Cypress Hills is located. And they're going to be migrating to the Cypress Hills annually in the spring, and then they will leave in the fall. So when they are both occurring in the Cypress Hills, it's, uh, uh, it's often referred to as the summer pupping season. So they are coming into Cypress specifically to have their pups and rear them throughout the summer. So it's a very important and very physiological stressful time of year because these are these are moms they are they are moms with new babies that they're going to have to be taking care of throughout the summer until the pups are capable of flying and capturing insects themselves and bat research in the cypress hills has been occurring for a pretty long time and regular capture data began in roughly the year 2000 so research in the area for over the last 20 years happening in roughly the same way so i set up a very uh, uh a collaborative research project that included five researchers spanning 20 years and collected data sets from these researchers from pretty much from June to August for all of the years that there were data collected. And what's really, really neat is that all of these researchers, including myself, uh, conducted this research in the same place at the roughly the same time of year in roughly the same exact places using roughly the exact same types of methods. So they're all mist netting surveys. So the way we capture bats in the summertime is by setting up these large mist netting poles, uh, pole sets with very fine mesh nets strung between them. And we capture bats all night long. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, and so uh, I collected all of these data sets and I wanted to ask a couple of questions. And I'm bringing it back to this slide with this quote again to highlight the fact that uh, hoary bat populations in particular are, are suffering on a on a range-wide scale population decline. And this has also been supported on large, on large spatial scales and regional spatial scales. So on large spatial scales, we see population decline. And so considering that I have these data sets from a small spatial scale spanning the 20-year time frame, um, in, in that 20-year time frame is also when wind energy has been growing in both Alberta and Saskatchewan, which is what the Cypress Hills straddles. So will we see a similar decline in the local abundance as seen on these larger spatial scales for both hoary and silver-haired bats? And what you can see here is this is one of my all-time favorite pictures of a silver-haired bat. Um, it is the grumpiest silver-haired bat I have ever seen in my life, and it will forever be one of my favorite pictures. So there you go. <laughs> uh, so to do this, we collected all of those data sets and we corrected for things uh, for our netting effort. I, I have this fun phrase that I like to say, which is more bat, more net, which is pretty much just a fun way to say, uh, if you have more nets out for longer periods of time, your probability of getting more bats is going to increase. So we had to kind of correct for that because not everyone had the same amount of nets or the same amount of pole sets up or netted for the same amount of time. And I used a hierarchical Bayesian model to estimate the change in the expected number of captures. So the output from this data analysis is probabilities of seeing an abundance decline or increase. And I controlled for things like the time of year, the temperature, and of course that netting effort. Okay, so for our hoary bats, uh, for hoary bat probabilities, the likelihood that we saw a decrease in their abundance by 50% had a 7% probability, by a 30% had a 15% probability, and then this is where it gets pretty exciting. We had a 40% probability that there was an abundance increase of under 30% and a 41% probability that it's increased by over 
This is even more extreme when we look at our silver-haired bats. There was only a 1% probability that we have seen a decrease in abundance by about 30% and a 96% probability that they have increased in abundance by at least 30%. So something really exciting is going on here in the Cypress Hills. There is no evidence of decreases in captures of hoary or silver-haired bats across the 20-year range of our data set. High probability that there is no change in local abundance of hoary bats and silver-haired bats appear to have increased. So what we see is a local scale abundance that is not indicative of overall population. And however, I do want to stress again that there is ample evidence of regional or larger spatial scale population decline. So this is local abundance, which is not always indicative of overall population. So what's going on then? What is happening in the Cypress Hills? Uh, so there's the some potential explanations. While well, with climate change, um, many different species are having latitudinal range expansion. So it could be that as the climate has been changing over the last 20 years, the range of the, of the species is moving. And so more of the species are coming into the Cypress Hills. Additionally, there has not been active uh, woody plant encroachment control in the Cypress Hills for some time. And there has been a very big increase in the number of potential roosting trees. Things like spruce and aspen have been increasing within the Cypress Hills over the past 50 plus years. And so that is the map that I have here in the right hand corner is the amount of forest cover within a portion of the Cypress Hills. So it's, it's going up. And so there's more available habitat for them to roost in in the summertime, which could have led to compensatory immigration. So because there is more available habitat for them to roost in and rear their pups, we have more, more of them coming into the Cypress Hills to do that. So really, my findings, it seems it highlights the importance of the Cypress Hills as important as an important location for the conservation of migratory bat species. Uh, what, it's one of the very few known locations, reproductive locations for both hoary and silver-haired bats, and it's supporting large numbers of both of these species. So it's a very important and very special place for the migratory bats that we have in Canada. Some ongoing research that I am currently conducting. Uh, this is a large part of my thesis project. Uh, some things that I also found interesting, both hoary and silver-haired bats are migratory tree roosting species. They're often captured in our nets at the same time in the same net right next to each other. So it led me to some interesting questions. How are two similar species that are both migrating to the same place at the same time to undergo the same action, which is to have and rear their pups, how are they able to coexist during such an important time? Uh, so we are collecting all sorts of samples, including fur, and with that fur I'm able to do analyses such as looking at their isotopic signatures, which will let me roughly know their isotopic niche or the, or the position they are in within the entire uh, isotopic scape or it, what trophic level they are foraging at. Or in other words, are they going to be competing with one another? And from the fur, I can also look at cortisol levels. And with fur, fur is going to be prolonged cortisol level and, and cortisol is related to stress level. And that fur is going to be grown by both of these species starting in June. And so the samples that I've collected, the fur samples that I've collected are indicative of the stress levels that they are experiencing at that location during the summer. So it's a snapshot of what they're experiencing within the Cypress Hills. Next, I have uh, fecal samples. And so we are running all sorts of tests to look at diet and diet analyses, and then wing photos, which can tell me more about flight efficiency and their size. So we can answer things such as, are they sharing a similar diet? Are hoary and silver-haired bats competing for the same resources? And if they are competing, which one is more stressed? Do smaller bats have more stress? And are there differences between adults and juveniles? So I have run some uh, rough statistics and has some preliminary findings. And for wing metrics, this is pretty uh, well known. Um, what I'm about to present to you is kind of already well known that uh, hoary bats are more migratory than silver haired bats. Uh, but this is all data collected from the Cypress Hills. And I looked at things such as aspect ratio and wing loading. 
So aspect ratio is going to give you an idea of how aerodynamic the bat is going to be. Uh, having a high aspect ratio means that the wings are going to be longer and they're going to be more narrow, which is better for a migratory species because they have to get, they have to get from point A to point B as quickly and efficiently as possible. And so my, high, more highly migratory species are going to have usually a higher aspect ratio. And that is exactly what I have found. So on the left, uh, Lacey is the hoary bat, Lazierus cinereus. And the silver-haired bat, Lano, is Lazio nicturus, noctivagans. And the hoary bat has a higher aspect ratio than the silver-haired bat. The next, uh, next metric is wing loading. And wing loading is related to the mean pressure on the wings. And so a higher wing loading means it's going to be flying uh, has, has faster flight. And yet again, exactly what I would expect, the more migratory species, the hoary bat, has higher wing loading than the silver-haired bat. Now looking at uh, some of the data from the fur samples, this is the uh, isotopic niche model that I ran, which is exploring the nitrogen to carbon isotopes, um, which is going to be related to what they are foraging on. So this is exploring whether or not hoary and silver-haired bats are going to be competing for similar resources. And the hoary bat is the black circle and the black dots, and the red is the silver-haired bat. Uh, and what I am seeing here, which is very interesting, is that there is a lot of overlap in this isotopic niche plot, which to me is saying that they are going to be competing for very similar resources, which I find incredibly interesting because if they are directly competing, how are they able to coexist together at such high levels and high uh, local abundance um, during such an important physiological and reproductive time? Uh, so cortisol levels, again, this is relating to stress, and this is also extracted from those fur samples. I see that the silver-haired bats are, have, have slightly higher cortisol levels when compared to our hoary bats, which if they are competing, this would make some sense to me because the silver-haired bats are going to be smaller than our hoary bats, uh, significantly smaller actually, and uh, so maybe they are having to work a little bit harder, therefore a little bit more stressed than our hoary bats. Looking specifically at species levels, uh, this is the silver-haired bat cortisol levels as predicted by mass. So as they are getting bigger, so bigger silver-haired bats have less cortisol than the smaller ones. And similar for our hoary bats, larger hoary bats have lower levels of cortisol when compared to our silver hair, or when compared to smaller hoary bats. Some exciting things that are still happening. In fact, this was just going on uh, yesterday. We are extracting DNA from the fecal samples that we have collected uh, over the course of the 2021 field season. And so we are trying to explore what specifically each one of these species are feeding on. So we are doing uh, DNA extraction to try and figure out what types of insects they're eating. And then we're also going to be doing microscopy of those same fecal samples uh, to kind of cro uh, cross confirm our findings with the DNA extractions as well. This will also give us a much better idea and to compare with the isotopic niche model, uh, because it could be that while their isotopic niches are overlapping, Maybe they are eating different insects, like maybe they are targeting similar but different insects. So more to find out and more to come as we move forward with this research. Going into the little brown myotis, uh, so this is the probably the most abundant species that we have out in the Cypress Hills currently. They are the number one species that we get in the net, uh, but they are endangered in Canada. So already right off the bat, again, it highlights the importance of the Cypress Hills as a really, really important location for bat conservation uh, because this endangered species is very abundant in the Cypress Hills during the summertime. But there's some important questions that we don't know yet within the province, such as where are they hibernating within the province? How are populations impacted by white nose syndrome? And what are ideal or important habitats? What are important foraging areas and how are they using space? And it's this last series of questions that uh, my collaborative team are trying to currently work on. So some ongoing research that we have is a very large collaborative project between uh, the U of R, Environment and Climate Change Canada, University of New Brunswick, Parks Canada, 
uh, the Ministry of the Environment and Wildlife Society Canada. And so this is my collaborative team down there at the bottom right. And it kind of, lead, it, it, I have to start it off with a question, which is what do an Atlantic salmon and a bat have in common? And the answer is this man. Uh, this is Dr. Kurt Samways. Uh, Dr. Samways is originally from Regina in the Regina area, and he's actually an alum of the U of R. And he is now currently um, a professor at the University of New Brunswick, and he has specialized in studying the movement ecology of Atlantic salmon. And he was here a couple, he was at the U of R a few years ago giving a seminar, and we started chit-chatting about his project and what he was doing and how he was monitoring the movement of these salmon. And when you think about a fish and a bat, you might not necessarily see a whole lot of commonality, but what they do have in common is space and how they use space. Water is a three-dimensional medium and air is a three-dimensional medium. You can go up in X, Y, and Z uh, for both of these. And so when we started talking about his antenna array system and how it was spread out across the creek and he could monitor the movement of these salmon, I proposed the question, well, what if you took that antenna and you put it above the water rather than below the water? And that led us to a large collaborative project that is an ongoing research project to study the large scale passive and passive monitoring and movements of bats in the Cypress Hills, and in particular of the little brown myotis. So the picture that you see on the left are a couple of the antennas that we set up over the summer to explore how bats are using the Battle Creek uh, within the West Block of Cypress Hills for movement. The Battle Creek bisects almost the entirety of the West Block uh, and bats seem to use it almost like a, like a little bat highway. They are using the creek as a corridor for movement. And so we wanted to use this antenna array system to explore how they're moving and using the Battle Creek uh, for navigation, for movement, uh, how they're moving, how far they're going, and also associating that with different forage. So here's a series of pictures of some of the different antennas and work that we did over the summer uh, and how these antenna arrays are set up. So we had a total of three different sites with two antennas at each uh, for six antennas total. And this is an ongoing continued collaborative project um, between Environment and Climate Change Canada for our funding source, uh, Dr. Sam Ways from the University of New Brunswick and through the U of R and all of us bat researchers here. Uh, to do this, we are using pit tags, and pit tags are incredibly small, unique identifying tags that get injected subcutaneously between the shoulder blades of the bats that we are studying. So they're very, very small, uh, and it's incredibly non-invasive, and we don't have to rely on recapturing bats in order to study their movement. To date, we have uh, put over 40 different tags for our little brown myotis, we have done over 25 hoary bats and we have done over 25 silver haired bats. So we haven't put out a ton, but this is a continuous project. And so every year that we are out there uh, in the Cypress Hills, we are putting out more pit tags and we'll be able to monitor more and more and more as we are moving forward. Uh, thinking about different types of recapturing methods, the pit tags are a great, great way to monitor the bats non-invasively. You know, you capture them once and then you can let them go and you can continuing, continue to monitor their movements if they are detected by the antennas. Uh, however, over this past summer, we had a very exciting observation, which was early on in the season, we captured a banded bat. Uh, so that is the picture that I have there in the bottom right, that little green tag is the armband. And after doing a lot of digging, we actually found the original capture data card. And this bat was originally captured in 1993, and it was already an adult little brown bat, which means that it was at least 29 years old, uh, which was an incredibly exciting uh, finding for us to find in the Cypress Hills. And it's the second of its kind. A few years before our recapture, there was a 23-year-old little brown bat that was also captured at the same location. Uh, what's really exciting about this is that 
Um, while recaptures of banded bats can happen, usually they are happening at places like a hibernacula. And bats have a lot of site fidelity when it comes to where they are hibernating. So it's not, it's not unheard of of capturing a bat again at a hibernacula. Uh, but recapturing a bat at a foraging location in the summer is very, very rare. So this is showing some very important site fidelity and age demographics of important foraging locations. Again, highlighting the importance of just how, in, uh, highlighting the importance of the Cypress Hills yet again. Uh, so there's a lot of collaboration when it comes to active research within the province, but then there's also a, just a lot of provincial collaboration overall between the federal government, provincial government, and universities all working together to put things together, such as a SASC bat working group. So there is, uh, in the works, uh, coming through the pipeline, is going to be an active SASC bat working group working towards the conservation of the, the at-risk species of bats in, in Saskatchewan. There's lots of federal funding initiatives uh, coming for bats, and so it's very it's an exciting time to be studying bats within Saskatchewan because there's a lot of um, exciting research opportunities coming up. Joint PD testing, again, that is the, fun uh, the fungus that causes white nose syndrome. So a lot of collaboration happening between all of the researchers across the province to monitor for PD. And then of course, things like this, public outreach and awareness uh, to help spread the knowledge and love of everything bats, because bats are amazing and everyone should love their bats. I have this certificate of recognition here because when you zoom into it, you can even see that as of this year, the week of October 24th to the 31st is now Saskatchewan's official bat week. So now we even have, uh, for public outreach and awareness, we even have a provincial bat week, which is very exciting. Uh, so with that, I have so many people to acknowledge, all of the collaborators and probably a lot more people that I haven't listed here, all of the different uh, support groups and funding resources. Um, yeah, and of course my lab. So with that, I would love to take any questions. First of all, thank you so much for the awesome presentation, Dana. It was really informative and I'm looking forward to bat week next year. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have a lot of questions here from our listeners, um, so I'm just going to give them to you kind of rapid fire if that's okay, and we'll try to get sure. through as many as we can. Um, so the first one, uh, will bats use or hibernate in cavities created by swallows in embankments? Oh, wow, that is a, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have like a 100% for sure answer there. Um, but what I can talk to is that uh, different species are going to be roosting in a variety of different structures. Some are much more specific than others. So uh, a species like the hoary bat is pretty much exclusively going to be selecting things like trees mm -hmm. or in a pinch, a shrub. Uh, hoary bats have been known to be found in a shrub, but you have other things like big brown bats and even silver haired bats, they will roost in the most bizarre places sometimes. Uh, so I don't know for sure if one has ever been found in a cavity created by a swallow, but I feel like if a bat were in a pinch and it needed a place to roost for the night, then it could very likely happen. <laughs> Interesting, thanks. Um, the next question, uh, what tree features are selected for as roost or, or breeding? So that again is always going to depend on the species. Mm -hmm. uh, so the ones that I can speak to are the silver-haired and hoary bats. Uh, in the summertime, when they are looking for trees to have their pups, uh, silver-haired bats are going to be looking for older aspen trees, oftentimes snags, that are uh, a, have a little bit wider of a base, larger DBH, and they're going to be very tall, and they're going to be way up there. So they're going to want to go high and go into some of the cavities that are formed when branches fall off, or uh, as things rot out, they will use the cavities created by that, um, and they will be in smaller colonies. So silver-haired bats are one of uh, are a so more social species in the summertime, and they will roost together in groups of four, five, upwards of 15 to 20 in a single roost. Uh, hoary bats are more selective. Uh, they are going to be roosting in mostly um, coniferous trees. They, are, they seem to prefer spruce trees, uh, at least in the Cypress Hills. They like those spruce trees, and you're only gonna find one. Uh, hoary bats do not roost socially 
uh, they are going to just be one hoary bat, uh, usually nestled into the branches of a spruce tree. Awesome. Thanks for that answer. Um, another listener is wondering about um, the impact of pesticides on bats directly. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's 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 a, a loaded uh, a loaded question because, uh, of course, pesticides are going to be affecting our insect eating bats. But it's not mm -hmm. just our insect eating bats. This is a, a, a very large conservation issue for all aerial insectivores currently. So um, across I believe, I don't know if it's just North America or if it's a global, I'm sure it's a global issue. Um, aerial insectivores in general, populations are drastically declining and our insectivorous bats are absolutely included in that. Thanks. Um, wind farms, why are wind farms so lethal to bats? Uh, so, they are mostly going to be causing issues for our migratory bat species and these migratory species are moving hundreds oftentimes over a thousand kilometers to get to their uh, either from from point a to point b so in the during the fall migration they are moving from their summering pupping locations including the juveniles um, to their overwintering grounds so where it's a little bit warmer and as they're migrating they are all of a sudden these massive wind farms that are popping out along their mig you know just like with birds they have migratory pathways yeah. uh, that we have yet to fully understand or determine mm -hmm. and as they're migrating these vast distances they are coming into contact with wind facilities and it appears and it is currently unknown as to why but in particular the hoary bat seems to be attracted to wind farms hmm. and it's been it's been a question that has eluded the, the answer has eluded bat researchers for years now as to why uh, we are seeing this attraction to places uh, to, to wind industry facilities uh, so as they come into the uh, wind farm something they can they can directly collide with the blades mm -hmm. but oftentimes um, when they come into the area that the blade is spinning, it can it has a very rapid change in pressure, and it can actually cause barometric trauma uh, to uh, their. I, I believe it's their inner ear, uh, but that might I might be mistaken in that context. Um, but all of a sudden, they just have this massive pressure change, and it causes uh, a mortality event. So unfortunate. Uh, so it, it is, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of active research and a lot of active effort to try and get ahead of the, you know, get ahead of it before it becomes even more of an issue because it's just going to get worse. So, um, a lot we've of had, effort. Yeah, it sounds like it. We've had a number of um, listeners write in about mitigation for, um, for wind farms. Do you, can you comment about um, mitigation measures in place? Um, I do not have a lot that I can say on, on what is being done with mitigation efforts right now. What I can speak to is that currently uh, the migratory species are not listed as threatened or endangered. And because they are not currently listed, there's no pressure uh, from things like government bodies onto industry to do any kind of mitigation action. Uh, because they don't have to yet. And that's why um, I, I am so, I feel so privileged and so thrilled to be a part of the team to try and, and get our migratory species listed as endangered, because once that happens, we can actually start seeing some productive change for the conservation of those species. That would be awesome. That'd be so great. Um, one of our listeners is wondering about collaboration with um, Mexico and southern parts of the U.S. Um, just because they are migratory species. Is anything happening on that front? There's a lot. I mean, there's a, a lot happening. Um, nothing. There's. I, I, I can't really say if there's any one group that is working all collaboratively together, you know, like the, the hoary bats in Mexico um, are very much likely to be passing through the United States and even potentially coming up to Canada. Uh, something that is very exciting that is currently happening, it's very new, is that there is this new conservation group called uh, the Global Bat Network. 
So there's all sorts of conservation groups. You know, there's Bat Conservation International. There's uh, there's conservation group bat conservation groups in Mexico, bat conservation groups in Canada, and this global bat network is connecting all of those networks together. So uh, pretty soon we're going to be having, I think, a lot more uh, collaboration towards uh, bat conservation uh, into the future. Awesome. So. That's great. That's great to hear. Um, somebody's wondering about the lowest winter temperature that bats can tolerate during hibernation. Ooh, that's a good question. Oh, I, I wish uh, I wish my supervisor Mike Brigham was here. Because, uh, he is a hibernation physiologist in the room. Okay. So. okay. I did see his name on the line today. So, oh. Mark, if you're listening, maybe you can type in an answer to that. But no pressure. <laughs> um, someone else is wondering about uh, natural hibernacula have been found in Saskatchewan. Are there any natural places here that they? Not that I not that I know of. Okay. Uh, so that's that's one of the big questions that um, ah. a lot of this research is. Going going to be going towards is to try and and actually find out where are these bats going in the winter time because that is mm -hmm. that's going to be very important for especially uh, the little brown myotis uh, once we can find out where they're hibernating we can do things like monitor those systems for, for pd monitor the population better than we already are um, yeah so uh, as far as i know we don't know yet <laughs> There's always something to learn. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's exciting to be a part of this community and part of this type of research because it, there is, there's a lot to find out. It's also frustrating because yeah. there's still so much we don't know. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mark has commented here that they can't tolerate lower than zero degrees for a long time, um, likely two to five degrees is best. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to hear about that later. <laughs> Uh, well, Dana, uh, Graham Parsons is wondering about pup survival. Do you know anything um, about how how well known they survive? Mortality of pups, is it high in the first year and gets better as they get older? Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so there, again, this is going to depend on species. Uh, so uh, the more sedentary and regional migratory species are most likely to have one pup. Mm -hmm. One pup that they take care of very, very, very well, and the survival is going to be a lot higher for that. But our migratory species will oftentimes twin. Uh, so silver-haired bats, hoary bats, eastern red bats, they will have twins. Uh, and that is because the, these migratory species undergo a very, very risky behavior, which is migration. Uh, so mortality for pups of migratory species is going to be a lot higher uh, than for the more sedentary species. Interesting, uh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Josh was wondering about what type of tree do little brown bats prefer when they're rearing pups? Do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, so they can, they roost in a lot more different types of structures. You can find them in things like our aspen trees, but little brown bats will also readily uh, have maternity colonies in human-made structures. Uh, so the biggest maternity colony that I have personally worked with in, in Saskatchewan was actually uh, located in an old shed that's in the Cypress Hills, uh, nestled into, I'm not, I'm not gonna say the location because it's a very sensitive spot, um, but it's, it's a man-made structure and there are hundreds hundreds of little brown bats that go wow. there every single summer. Uh, wow. So they can roost in the trees, but they can also readily roost in man-made structures as well. Interesting. Um, so speaking of the little brown bat, um, Ashley is wondering, why are some bats referred to as myotis instead of bat when it comes to their common name? Is there something special about the myotis bats that make it necessary to specify their genus? Um, it's kind of just a semantics thing. So, okay. uh, Myotis is the genus, and there are multiple different types of myotis species that you can find in Saskatchewan. So there's uh, myotis avotis, myotis lucifugus, uh, myotis volans, uh, myotis septentrionalis. There's a lot of different myotis bats. And uh, depending, I, I mean, even within bat, the bat research community, some people will strictly refer to them as, uh, if they're their common name, the little brown myotis. Others will say the little brown bat. And I, I don't really know if there's a reason behind referring to the common name using the genus or not. 
Uh, I just, I tend to do it a little interchangeably. Uh, so there's no, I don't think that there's any one particular reason or not. I think it's just a semantics thing. Uh, okay. But there are many different types of myotis bats, lots of myotis yeah. bats. Yeah, that's good to know. Thanks. Um, so just regarding the question about hibernation, um, Melanie from Saskatoon, she says, Melanie Elliott here in Saskatoon, um, and she's developed a hibernation protocol for uh, big brown bats, and she keeps uh -huh. the cold cellar at 5 to 16 degrees to hibernate them. So that sounds like a good answer too. Thank you, Melanie, for writing in. Um, yeah. And then Shirley says, what a cool study. Um, I especially appreciate the fecal analysis. Uh, no more long hours hovering over microscopes to ID bug bits and poop samples. <laughs> <laughs> we, will and then, still, we will still be spending many hours looking yeah. at bug bits and pieces in the, in the fecals as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then question about how bats use the Battle Creek Corridor. It looks like that your antennae are collecting data over the Creek Corridor. Do you also collect data from the riparian area? Uh, yes, yes and no. Okay. Uh, so the way that we uh, set up our antenna array, we wanted to explore how they were moving along the Creek and also how they were accessing potential foraging sites. And so at our, we only have three sites, so we don't have a lot of like a lot of playroom uh, with where we set these up. And once they're set up, they are, they're set up. It was, it was quite an ordeal to get those antennas uh, set up the way that we did. But at some of the locations, we have them where one antenna is over the creek and not far from that spot where we set up the other antenna, it goes into a potential foraging location. Uh, so one is going perpendicular with the creek and another antenna is going parallel with the creek to see how they're using potential corridors. And that would go into that riparian, kind of that riparian aspect of things, riparian uh, movement. Yeah, so Thanks. yes and no, a little bit of both. <laughs> Um, do you know how much time bats spend over the riparian area versus water over the creek? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> stay but tuned. We'll, we'll stay tuned, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I guess something I didn't mention about the antenna array system is while we did, um, we, we got the, ent the entire system up a little bit later in the year than what we were planning, so we didn't get to have it up as long as we would have liked. And uh, it, we did release the bats while the antennas were up and functioning. So what we were able to demonstrate this past summer is that the system can work. And by can work, I mean we, we uh, tested it out by uh, the bats that we captured in a night. We would release right next to the antenna to see if it would fly, like if it would, if it would even fly through you know, because we're putting up something new in its environment. So we wanted to make sure that they weren't just avoiding it completely. Uh, and they're not, they will fly through and it does trigger the antenna, uh, which we weren't also not sure about. So it does work. Now we just have to get as many of those pit tags out as we can because we haven't gotten what I was referring to as a natural detection. Uh, so a bat just flying through without, you know, me being the one standing there releasing it next to the antenna. So uh, we know that it can work and now we just have to get a natural detection. Awesome. Um, I know we're running a little bit later time. Are you okay to stay on for another five minutes or so? Yeah, sure. I'll okay. try to answer questions. Okay, as best perfect. As I There's can. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it's great. People are engaged. It's awesome. <laughs> um, so one question is, are, is there any data supporting natural resistance developing in North American species of bats to PD? Uh, very good question. So um, the mechanism, I don't think has, uh, I don't think that there's a mechanism understood as to whether or not they mm -hmm. are actually resistant. But what I have, uh, what I have read and what I have heard is that there are resilient populations that have been impacted, like white nose and PD has hit their, hit their habitat, hit the cave, passed through, the population plummeted, and it appears that the remaining bats are less susceptible to infection and are beginning to have very, very slight recovery. 
so uh, not enough is understood yet, and there's still a lot of research going into it, but it does appear that the populations that are left over, the individuals that are left over, do appear to have a little bit more resistance. That's great. And there's also species like the big brown bat, mm -hmm. um, for some reason, is very resistant towards infection, and they can cope with it a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a lot of researchers use big brown bats to try and understand what exactly is going on physiologically when they become infected with white nose syndrome, because they can tolerate it a lot better. Yeah, that is very interesting. Thanks. Um, Anne is wondering if you've considered using the MODIS wildlife tracking system for studying bat movements and migration. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, yes. <laughs> it would be wonderful if we could get a huge series, a huge array of MODIS towers implemented throughout the province, um, because it takes a lot of towers for there to be a lot of detection to understand uh, how the bats are moving. Uh, so you're talking a lot about a lot of infrastructure build that mm -hmm. would need to happen for that to be a successful study. Um, but those conversations are happening. Uh, so we'll see. Maybe within the next few years, there will be an increase in the amount of MODIS towers that go up so that we can passively monitor migratory pathways, which would just be, it would be lovely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Carmen is wondering, do you have any experience with audio moths collecting data? Uh, yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of those. Uh, I have used audio moths, but not for bat research. Uh, I used audio moths for a, uh, a tiger vocalization project that I was helping out on. Uh, so I've never used it in the context of bat research. Okay. Uh, so I can't really speak, speak to that. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Um, and then Joshua was wondering about um, the effectiveness of bat houses for bat conservation. Do you have any comments? Yeah, bat houses are a great way for, like, if you want to try and, like, make a small difference or even, like, just provide a little bit of habitat within your yard for bats, a bat house is going to be a great way to do that. Um, it, can, it can take years for a bat house to become occupied. So I feel like, you know, like with bird houses, a bird will move in right away. Mm -hmm. Bats are bats are kind of picky, you know, like they're they're a little bit more persnickety about where where exactly they're going to be roosting. And where you place the bat house is also incredibly important. There was a, a lot of a, a very good research paper that came out last year that showed uh, if a bat house is placed improperly with too much sun exposure or it gets too much heat you can actually cook out your your bats that are in your bat house. Oh no. And so making sure that the mm -hmm. bat house is placed properly for where you live is very important. Making sure that it does get enough heat but also doesn't get full sun exposure throughout the day. It has to have a little bit of shade in there. Uh, and so there's a lot of actually like really great resources on uh, Bat Conservation International's webpage to uh, to think about how to properly place your bat house. And they even have plans if you wanted to build one. And you can always just buy one. Uh, but if you wanted to build one, then they also have plans that you can use to make and model your own. Yeah, I think the Canadian Wildlife Federation has some really good plans designed for yes, the Canadian yes, wilderness. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, they might have better recommendations on placement, hmm. proper placement for where, where we all are. Yeah, yeah, because if you're going to make it, you might as well put it out properly. <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, we're going to call it there. There's still lots more questions, but we just are never going to have time to get to them all. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you so much, Dana, for sharing your wealth of information with us, your enthusiasm. Um, this was a really <laughs> amazing presentation just to, to hear about all of your experience. And we've had a lot of um, different uh, members of the audience write, write in to say excellent presentation, a presenter, great enthusiasm. So I just really want to reiterate that. So thank you, Dana. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really, really glad to be here today. Yeah, well, we're great to have you. <laughs> I'm really glad to have you. Um, to all of our listeners out there, thank you so much for catching today's webinar. Um, it will be on the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. And we will also um, have webinars coming up in January, February, March. So check out the PCAP uh, website to be able to register for those. And I just want to remind you when you leave our webinar today, there'll be a quick one minute survey that'll pop up. If you don't mind filling it out, we really appreciate that. So we can keep our webinar series going on for another
another year. Um, and I think that's everything. So with that, thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.